Patient-Centered Primary Care Collaborative, and I'd like to welcome you all to our webinar this afternoon, Engaging Primary Care Practices in Quality Improvement. We see there are many of you uh, on the phone this afternoon uh, and, and on your computers, and we're, we're just thrilled to have so many of you participating. Today we're going to be learning about some of the fantastic new resources uh, that AHRQ uh, has available, and as well as learning some strategies to help us build and sustain practices' ability to actually engage in quality quality improvement activities. It's not nearly as easy as it sounds. There's a new white paper uh, that we encourage you um, to, to download that actually describes these approaches um, and the practice facilitators, who are also known as coaches. Um, uh, it goes into some detail about what these coaches do to encourage primary care practices to undertake quality improvement. I'm going to introduce our speakers. Um, I'm going to talk uh, just very briefly uh, about how important AHRQ is um, to the PCPCC and then give you a couple of housekeeping uh, rules and we will get started. Uh, today's lineup is absolutely stellar. Um, long time uh, friends of the PCPCC, uh, starting with our friend Dr. Jonathan Sugarman, who is the president and CEO at Qualys Health uh, in Seattle, although they, do, although they do work all over the country. Uh, Julie Schills, uh, who is the vice president for care delivery and transformation at Anthem. Um, she is uh, in so many ways uh, a, a, a true star in uh, the work that the PCPCC has done. She has been with us since um, our beginning, and she serves in many, many leadership roles uh, at the PCPCC. Um, and so we're, we're thrilled to have her on uh, today's presentation. Carla Silverman, who is the Director of Clinical and Training Initiatives at the Primary Care Development Corporation, also a PCPCC member, um, PCDC in, in New York, offering fantastic leadership um, in the space of practice transformation among uh, leadership just around primary care. We've got Kristen Gionati, um, who is a health researcher at Mathematica Policy Research. Um, Mathematica doing fantastic work, um, not only with AHRQ, but in several federal initiatives, helping guide us as we seek to improve uh, the, the patient-centered medical home model. Uh, and last but not least, our friend Bob McNellis, uh, who's the Senior Advisor for Primary Care at the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality. Uh, a AHRQ uh, is today's star of the show. As I mentioned, I wanted to talk a little bit about how much the PCPCC values the work that AHRQ does. They are the leading federal agency that supports system delivery and health services research. Uh, and, and we use their resources each and every day, uh, prominently display them, uh, and are so grateful for all of the ways in which they are researching the area of primary care. If you haven't gone to their website, to see the, the myriad kinds of um, resources and tools that they offer. Uh, today is just one brief snapshot in, into some of what they do. Um, we are concerned about some of the activity happening on Capitol Hill, uh, particularly on the House side, where HRQ is uh, being proposed to be eliminated as a, as a federal agency. Um, as you might imagine, given how much we rely on uh, HRQ, uh, we consider that to be not only detrimental uh, to the patient-centered medical home movement and primary care, but really to health system transformation uh, writ large. Uh, and so want to make sure that everybody recognizes um, that HRQ uh, is, of, of, is of great value um, and apparently um, is getting caught up in, um, in some of the, the policy uh, appropriations process in Congress. And so uh, we certainly will be offering our support in the days to come uh, for, for keeping HRQ strong. Let's get to our uh, presentation today, and um, I ask that you use the webinar software that um, you've logged in on to, to ask questions and to provide comments. And there's a drop-down box, uh, a drop-down question box on your screen, and about the last 15 minutes or so, we'll be uh, at when our hosts are done uh, presenting, we're going to open that up for Q&A. And we've got Amy Gibson, who is our Chief Operating Officer, who will be uh, facilitating that conversation. 
Um, again, would just want to note this is a webinar that's got um, hundreds of people on it today, um, but we want to get uh, the word out on the terrific work that AHRQ is doing, and so this webinar will be posted to our website within the next 24 hours. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to uh, our guest speakers today uh, and thank them and thank all of you for being with us. Great. Thanks, Mark. Uh, the methods that we used for the paper, which you'll see on the next slide. Um, to distill strategies for engaging practices in QI, we used three sources of information for the paper. Uh, we first conducted a targeted scan of the published and unpublished literature on engaging practices, focusing in on strategies that external organizations could use to achieve practice buy-in, as well as internal factors that may make practices more or less receptive to working actively with um, these types of external support organizations. We then convened a technical expert panel, as I was mentioning, of six experts who are nationally recognized in providing TA and support to primary care practices as they undertake QI or practice redesign. Um, and they really provided us with substantive and technical feedback on our approach. And of course, we learned um, from their many experiences. 
We also followed up with additional in-depth interviews to discuss their experiences, uh, the experiences and perspectives of experts from a range of organizations, including, you can see here, a payer, a QI organization, a State Department of Health, and an academic institution. I don't even know where we are today. Uh, so the experts um, were representing decades of collective organizational and personal experience in transforming more than 6,000 practices in 44 states. And the idea here was really to distill the lessons learned and insights for working with practices to improve the quality of care. Next slide. Next slide, please. So I think before attempting to engage a practice, it's important to understand the practice's readiness to engage, which we thought about as comprised of two components, the first one being willingness to change, and then the second being organizational stability and resources. And I think um, together these concepts could, can describe a practice's readiness to engage, which can help a facilitator determine whether it's an appropriate time to, to work with a practice. And if so, if it is an appropriate time, can allow a practice facilitator to tailor the approach in a way that best meets their needs. So here we define willingness to change. Great, thanks. So in terms of these two concepts, we defined here willingness to change as the motivation and receptivity that people in the practice have toward engaging in QI and then also working with the practice facilitator. Um, so this can be thought of as a practice's commitment to change. And then the second concept is organizational stability and resources. Um, so this involves the presence of practice leadership, adequate financial and other resources, including time, uh, culture with a positive attitude toward change, and then the absence of a disruptive level of organizational stress. I'm muted. So the next uh, portion of the session was going to be, um, uh, Kristen was going to moderate a discussion. What we might do is, um, this is Bob McNellis from AHRQ, and I can talk a little bit through uh, Kristen's remaining slides, um, having worked on the paper with her uh, fairly closely. So if you like, I'll just pick up where Kristen had left off. Um, to, that to would talk. be perfect. Great. Thanks, Bob. Oh, sure. Well, as uh, Kristen was highlighting, uh, one of the great things about the paper was it uh, began to create a framework for engaging practices in QI and, and looked at several factors. And one of the important ones was uh, practices' uh, readiness to engage. And um, there were two components to that readiness to engage. And I think other um, organizations that have done this kind of work um, have looked at this in other ways as well. But, but the first had to do with the, the willingness to change. Does the practice have the motivation and the receptivity um, to engage in QI? And, to, and more importantly, to work with a practice facilitator to do that. I think that, that willingness we found to be really important. The second one, though, was just as important. It was almost the bar by which practices had to um, uh, meet before they could even think about changing, and that was um, the organizational stability and resources of the practice. For practices that are poorly resourced or have a lot of turnover um, or a lack of leadership, it's really difficult to have them engage in QI and with practice facilitation, having external people come in. So if we go to the next slide, um, the next slide talks a little bit about, forgive my shuffling of papers here. It's actually this nice two by two table um, that um, uh, Kristen and others put together based on feedback from experts that puts on these two dimensions, um, their ability or willingness to change, their readiness to change, along with their organizational stability. And you have to have both of those components ideally to really be receptive to that kind of uh, readiness to engage with a practice facilitator. And you see that highlighted in the, the green square in the upper right quadrant there is practices that both have the willingness, uh, they want to make changes, want to engage in uh, quality improvement, as well as have the resources to be able to do that. So next slide, please. So with that is sort of basic introduction to the paper, I think the most important part of what we're going to hear today is, is really the, are the discussion with the panelists who are doing this kind of work and really informed uh, the work in the paper itself. So um, Marcy had the um, uh, thoughtfulness to uh, introduce our panelists already. I'll just remind you who they are, uh, and then we'll begin the discussion. So uh, next slide, please, Marcos. First, you've already met uh, Jonathan uh, Sugarman, who's President and CEO of Qualys Health. Thanks again for being here, Jonathan. Next slide. 
shows us the smiling face of Julie Shills. Julie, welcome. Uh, she's Vice President for Care Delivery Transformation at Anthem. Thanks again for being here, Julie. And one more slide, next slide, is Carla Silverman. And Carla is the Director of Clinical and Training Initiatives at the Primary Care Development Corporation. Carla, thank you also for being here today. So let's go ahead and start off with uh, the discussion. Carla, I'm going to send the first question out to you. Um, and that is, uh, what are some of the most important factors that shape a practice's capacity to engage in QI? Actually, um, I'm, I think, Carla, I suspect you're still muted. So, Jonathan, do you mind if I turn to you? Uh, that would be just fine. Great. Well, thanks. Well, um, uh, actually, do you mind uh, t uh, talking a little bit? I'm going to reframe the question for you a little bit because I think one of some of the work that you've done is really looking at strategies for engaging practices um, and especially what their characteristics might be and how they might differ. Do you mind talking a little about that? You know, for example, early adopters versus reluctant practices, uh, some that have different levels of HIT capacity and staff availability. Can you talk a little about some of those strategies? Sure, Bob. Um, thank you. And before I answer that question, though, I would just like to uh, commend ARC and Mathematica on the report and to recommend to those of you who are on the phone to really carefully look at both the Quick Start Guide and then the document itself. We're going to be able to just touch uh, just the surface of some of these things, but I actually found it to be very practical and helpful. Um, so, uh, you know, we'll spend a couple minutes on this, but there's really a tremendous depth in the report. So the question is, how, how, does, how might strategies differ for engaging practices based on different characteristics and things like early adopter versus reluctant, those who have health IP capacity uh, versus those who don't, um, those who have ready availability of staff versus those who don't. Um, you know, part of the issue is that uh, practices really don't come with a little sign around their neck that answers all those questions. So in some ways, there actually may not be very different strategies from the beginning. I think your paradigm of trying to assess willingness to change in organizational stability and resources at the start is really a very helpful way of doing things. Um, now, it's certainly the case that although the fundamental elements of engaging practice don't necessarily differ by the practice characteristics, the cadence does, the level of effort required to get things moving often does. Um, and a lot of this actually depends not so much on the characteristics of the practice, although those can be important, but in the context. So for instance, um, practices that have gone out to try and uh, uh, identify a facilitator to help with some specific quality improvement initiative or patient-centered medical home transformation project and are highly engaged um, are not actually terribly difficult to get started with. Um, there's actually a nice little note in the paper you've quoted uh, Bruce Bagley when he was with TransferMed saying that our niche is um, to feed hungry fish, and that's often a lot more fun than other circumstances. That's one end of the continuum. The other end of the continuum, though, is when a practice has kind of been uh, identified as being a candidate for coaching or practice facilitation, um, often by an external entity. It can be a government agency or a health plan or something like that. Um, or, uh, as commonly, um, the kind of central office, uh, somebody who's affiliated with a large network, but there's no either proximal reward for participation or negative consequence for not. So there's obviously a huge continuum. So I would say that really the first uh, step to engaging practices is to identify where in that continuum there are. Now, where in that continuum the practice is. Now that said, um, there are certainly different opportunities that one has in a practice that has advanced uh, information technology capacity and easily can uh, use registries, identify its population. Um, that's one set of opportunities for a practice facilitator to start working with a practice. A practice that has either just implemented an EHR or uh, is one of the few that doesn't have one yet, or uh, more commonly, has an EHR that's kind of okay for face-to-face -face visits, but it's not, is not necessarily well configured to help facilitate quality improvement, um, that's often something that um, deserves some attention at the beginning. One thing I think is important, um, and again, this is kind of uh, depends on the project, is to think about a sequence of engagement. We actually have this series of uh, change concepts that start off very similar to the paradigm in this paper, uh, focusing on organizational leadership, assuring that there's a quality improvement uh, infrastructure methodology in place, really beginning to work 
on uh, team development. So the way that one approaches a practice that has well-functioning teams, either clinical teams or transformation teams, is really quite different from those where people are just kind of used to doing their jobs but don't think of themselves as a team. So I'd say um, that's one of the key uh, uh, areas in which the strategy for the engaging the practice might be quite different. Um, I think that given the time I'll stop there, maybe we can circle around to this later, but um, perhaps that's at least the way to start um, the conversation. Yeah, I love that, Jonathan. That's really, actually, I, I like the two things you laid out. One is, I had never heard of it, is the cadence of how you be begin to engage practices. It actually makes a lot of sense to me. And then along the continuum, as well as the sequence, all, all important things. Um, I appreciate those insights. And, and actually, it sort of speaks to how do you get some early wins when you're, um, when you're working with a practice. And maybe, Julie, actually, do you mind maybe picking up with that thought a little bit? Is Can you think of, are there some strategies that you can think of that might be a, an easy win for that first QI project. Um, uh, perhaps you have some experience where you can describe some of those examples that help to, helps to build the confidence and, and begin that engagement that Jonathan has talked about. Sure. Thanks so much, Bob. And I just want to double check that people can hear me. We can. I can. And so it's at least you and me. Great. Great. Yeah. <laughs> Perfect. And, and this is Carla. I can hear you too. Perfect. Thanks so much. Um, so we're all back on. That's great news. Um, and and so when you know when you think about those early wins, I think one of the strategies that we found to be successful is truly starting small um, with the QI project, particularly as a group is learning learning this work, just starting out in their transformation journey. So it's about not boiling the ocean and what you want to accomplish. And the reality is that can be really hard for healthcare professionals. <laughs> that's that's not in our psyche. You know, if we see a problem, we want to fix it and fix all of it. Um, so thinking about starting small with that very first QI project, and this can really work with any size of practice. We probably have lots of different individuals on the phone right now. Some of you may be practice facilitators. Some of you may be thinking about starting quality improvement projects um, in your organizations. So it could be you're a very large organization and you have multiple practice sites. Maybe you pick one of your practice sites that you want to start some of the first QI projects with, and maybe even a subset of, of individuals within that practice site. Or you're a large practice. You may have one facility and starting with a subgroup of, of um, individuals in your practice, kind of those willing sort of folks who are always willing to, to try something new and innovative. Or you might be a small independent practice and you can count the number of staff on one hand and then it's a matter of getting your, you know, everyone together for a QI meeting at, at, at lunchtime. So thinking about that smaller group, thinking about a group of willing participants um, is a great way to start on a QI project. Um, some of the work with those initial QI projects is really about having the team understand how to work together, um, having, having everyone have a voice in the process, learning some QI methodologies and skill sets in that process, um, using your data to understand where you might have some opportunities, and, and really um, creating that, that area of focus. Um, then moving, you know, moving that first QI project into uh, a sequence of plan, do, study, act cycles, uh, and then moving on to sharing and spread um, with that. But if you, you know, if you start, if you start small, you can learn some of these new techniques. It could be that your leadership, in some um, cases, defines for you your, kind of your overall area for work. There could be a strategy among among your leadership groups that they want to focus on, or it could be that the team can decide based on their passion where they would want to start with. Um, we've seen groups be successful when they start sort of inside the walls of their their practice, so to say, and in thinking about areas that they have control over. Um, that often lends the group to being successful with that first QI, uh, QI uh, process. And you know, really quickly, just giving a use case example, I'm thinking about an organization. This was a practice that had um, three physicians and two nurse practitioners, so a very large independent one, one site uh, practice. And they knew from their data that they wanted to work on diabetes. Um, that, you know, to deliver effective evidence-based care in diabetes is incredibly multifaceted. So they dialed it back to a component of 
delivering effective diabetes care. And so what they decided to do is start with pre-visit planning. So even within pre-visit planning, um, the work around uh, working with your diabetic patients can be multifaceted. So then they even moved it down a little bit smaller into thinking about, okay, um, we want to make sure that our diabetics in our practice have their hemoglobin A1C done before they come in for a visit. So where they started with is looking every day for a week um, at who was coming in and their diabetic patients and looking into the EHR and deciding, gosh, has the hemoglobin A1C been done? So that was a, a, a first place to start to get their process to know that they always consistently knew the diabetics were coming in and knew that they had a hemoglobin globin A1C. So they started there and then they expanded. The next step they wanted to do was making sure they had a tobacco ask. The next thing they wanted to do is make sure they had the connections right as, as their patients were in the practice. And lastly, they started working on their care management and care coordination. So you can start small and get to that greater picture that you want to achieve and, and it, it's still okay. Um, but just to, to create that win and have a successful pr first project really sets up um, anyone for the next step in ongoing success. Thanks, Julie. This is Kristen. Thank you. Again. I'm going to hand it back to Kristen now. Kristen, I'll let you uh, manage the, the Q&A here. Great. Thanks, Bob. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Sure can. Great. Thanks for bearing with me with the technical difficulties. So thanks, Julie. That was great. And two things that I heard you mention early on were um, thinking about having the leadership and the passion. And I think that's a nice segue to get back to the initial question that we were um, going to discuss with Carla. And so I'd like to just go back to that first question and um, ask Carla about a practice's capacity for engaging in these initiatives. And so I'm wondering if, Carla, you could describe for us some of the most important factors that you see as shaping a practice's capacity to engage in QI. Um, so I think the first most, most important factor that shapes a practice's capacity to engage in QI work is, as, as everyone has already said, that leadership is engaged. And I, I want to reference the, the statement that Jonathan Sugarman makes um, in the report that where he says, will and desire are not enough. And I couldn't agree with that more. Um, you know, what you really need is leadership that actually is leading and is providing resources and can really help follow through on the project work. And you want leadership to understand the bigger purpose of the project and their, one of their main roles is to make the connection for their staff about how the QI work relates to the bigger picture mission and strategy of the organization. And engaged leadership also means that they're able to assign a capable project lead and uh, provide perfect protected time for staff to hold meetings, to do the work, and it may mean providing money to support taking staff off the floor from seeing patients or for things like IT upgrades, or possibly for training for staff to learn new ways of delivering care. Uh, the second most important factor, I would say, in terms of a capacity's ability to engage in QI is that the culture of the organization is one that respects and values the views and input of all their staff. Um, one of the foundational ways that PCDC works with clients is that we recommend that they assemble a project team that includes clinical staff and administrative staff, and that includes staff with different levels of authority. Uh, for example, we might suggest that they have a doctor and a nurse or a medical assistant, as well as a center director and a front desk person. Um, and depending on the project, we might also suggest an IT person. Um, Many organizations have a tendency to make changes by assembling a management group alone, and this is really not the way we recommend proceeding. Um, changes that are being dictated from the top down alone often have a way of not being sustained or fully adapted because staff are not bought in, or the changes don't really make sense since they were made without the input from the on-the-ground staff about uh, what processes are, are really happening. Um, so we really feel that working with organizations that already believe that um, insight or uh, the solution to a problem can come from anyone in the organization makes change significantly easier. Um, that being said, I will say that we also find it essential to have a clinical champion, preferably an MD on board uh, for QI work. Um, this one I would say is it's easy to overlook or not press for. Uh, I myself have had the experience of um, scheduling project meetings, talking to the project lead, 
um, getting to the project meeting and finding out that the doctor's not there. And when you uh, sort of dig a little deeper, you find out that nobody blocked the doctor's schedule um, and that no one really thought through, you know, having it, uh, having that doctor be at that meeting. So you have to actually push a little bit to have this happen. But without representation from doctors, uh, we find that transformation is, is unlikely. Um, doctors need to be aware of changes that are being made, and they need to be able to give their input and their feedback um, if, if the changes are really going to be integrated. And, and doctors need to feel that um, the changes that are happening make sense for them and make sense for their patients. Uh, so I'll, I'll, I think I'll leave it at that. Great. Thanks, Carla. So we heard Carla just mention including staff um, with all levels of authority in this process. And I think there's also a role for patients in this process. And we talk a, a bit about that in the paper. So I'd like to return to Jonathan to discuss this topic of patient engagement um, in the process, which I think is a really important component. So Jonathan, I'm wondering if you could offer your insights on successes that you have had engaging patients in QI and um, practice redesign and kind of what was important in those successes. And I think this is the fourth question, um, if you just want to advance the slides. Great. So I guess first I have to say that while facilitators can engage practices, um, it's really essentially always the case that it's the practices themselves that engage patients. So um, when you ask what successes have we had, really it's successes in working with the practices to get them uh, uh, the resources they need to kind of meaningfully engage patients. Now that may be obvious, but it's kind of important um, because the really the role of the external facilitator is focused on supporting and encouraging practices to be open to patient engagement in their QI or transformation work. Um, and honestly, in our experience, that's often a long-term effort that requires significant uh, uh, time to really kind of get uh, for practices to kind of be ready for that. Um, now. So, so it typically starts, you know, lots of practices think that, that, that patient engagement means getting patient experience or satisfaction survey. That's obviously a pretty low bar. It's not what most people mean by engaging patients in quality improvement. Um, one often hears, um, particularly from advocates for patient engagement, um, that one should involve or engage patients in quality improvement initiatives from the beginning, as soon as you start off. Um, and I, I will say that we've often heard practices who have done it at some point say they wish they had done it sooner. I will say, and this may be a little bit politically incorrect, um, my sense is that practices um, that are going to be successful engaging patients actually have to have a few things in place before moving forward. Um, Carla just mentioned, for instance, uh, PCDC's and many others' belief that it's important to have a team that's not just a management team that includes frontline staff. That's often a first step. You really have to have a functioning team, a well-functioning team, in order to be able to uh, invite patients to participate in that team in those processes. So if a practice um, hasn't had some success in making some type of improvement or change, it's not clear that just bringing patients to the table will magically make that happen. So Julie talked about kind of the easy wins. It's nice to have some of those so people feel confident that things can change. Um, there are all kinds of issues that people bring up ranging from HIPAA to they can't possibly uh, understand the complexity to practice. Um, so one has to kind of work through those things. Um, it's a, it's a uh, a process to get many practices, practices at least, to um, really want to bring um, some of their uh, patients and customers into the activity. That said, um, we've often seen uh, that meaningful patient involvement in QI or transformation activities um, really can serve as a tremendous catalyst for progress and transformation. Uh, just an example, over the past couple of years, we've had the opportunity to work with about 20 um, practices affiliated with Harvard Medical School in something, uh, a project known as the Academic Innovations Collaborative that's sponsored by the Harvard Medical School Center for Primary Care. Um, it's a whole range of different practices from large, uh, complex internal medicine practices at um, academic medical centers to affiliated community health centers. Um, some of them actually started off with some kind of patient engagement, so I'll tell you a story about that in a second. Um, but it's one of the things that's happened over the past few years is that the vast majority of those um, practices have now brought them in um, and uh, believe that it's really materially helped them to um, understand uh, what parts of their uh, process, the experience that patients have really can get improved. Uh, it's helped them to um, understand uh, things that are not obvious from the inside 
um, but are uh, either barriers or facilitators to patients. And so it's been quite helpful. So one, I'd say if people are looking for a good example of this and, and want to learn about how to engage patients, um, an organization like the Cambridge Health Alliance is a really terrific example. Now, um, they've been doing this work for years. That, um, they actually have been a leader in this collaborative I just talked about, and their model has been adopted by others. But um, each of their practices has um, uh, a team of patients. They actually have engaged a patient um, at kind of the central level to help support patient partners in these activities. Um, that's one thing I think practices need to know is you can't just kind of uh, bring them to the table um, and expect them to understand the process. You really need to have a fair amount of support, um, being clear about expectations um, and uh, uh, things that patients uh, can say and do. Um, uh, so that's something I think that it's, it's more than just inviting someone in. You really have to nurture and support patients once they're there. Um, the uh, other thing I think is important is that the practices need to recognize that simply having a patient there in a token or symbolic role and after all the work has been done, turning to the patient saying, what do you think of that, is really nowhere near as effective um, as having uh, the right person help choose the topics, help uh, um, as the process is moving forward really have uh, a meaningful uh, participatory role in conversations and discussions. Um, so, you know, when when we kind of look at the outcomes of this, if you have, say, a learning session that has 20 teams and has uh, a couple of dozen patients participating in those teams, um, and patients are the one, for instance, who stand up at a team report out session to talk about um, some project that the uh, practice has been involved in, that's pretty good evidence that patients are genuine participants rather than just kind of observers in the process. Um, it takes a while to get there, um, but it's something that folks find really helpful. Great. Thanks, Jonathan. Um, I think the importance of good communication has already come through as we've been um, talking today, but I'm wondering if, if Carla could just talk a bit more explicitly about the importance of communicating with the practice as we do this work and perhaps just some um, kind of best practices for, for good communication. For example, what are some of the most effective ways to maintain contact? Do you meet with practices in person and how often? So I'm wondering if we could just talk a bit about some of these um, kind of best practices for good communication. Sure. Um, so I would say my, my first uh, and best practice um, is something that is related to uh, something that's mentioned in the report. You guys talk about tailoring your message. And I like to uh, phrase this as stand in their shoes. Um, I think a key skill for being able to effectively work with primary care practices is to be able to speak their language and to understand the stresses that their staff go through day in and day out. Um, you know, what's it like to be a medical assistant in their practice? What's it like to be a doctor or a front desk staff? Uh, how does the billing person in the back office feel? And your ability to articulate what issues they face and to offer understanding and, and really enthusiasm for tackling those issues with them is, is key because um, just like we have to do with patients, when you're doing facilitating work, you have to build a trusting relationship with those staff that you're going to work with. and. I really think that means establishing yourself as someone who fundamentally gets them and wants to help make their lives easier, right? You don't want them to see this project as just something else loaded onto their plate. You want them to be excited about it and you want them to feel like when it's all over, the project is going to make their lives uh, easier and, and better. Um, sort of side by side with that, I would say my second best practice is to acknowledge the importance of what they do and the often unrecognized nature of what they do. Um, I think we all know that most people who work in primary care, particularly primary care for the safety net population, are not receiving awards or taking home large paychecks. They're, they're working there because they're dedicated to it and they have a passion for it. But, but the reality is they're always on the verge of burning out. So you want to be able to message QI work as work that serves the twin purposes of improving patient care uh, and outcomes while also, as I said before, making life better for the staff. Um, in terms of some more specifics about communication, you want to engage leadership early and often. So, you know, we talked about establishing that at the beginning of the project, but one of our best practices here at PCDC is that we schedule periodic check-ins with leadership. Um, it's an easy skip to step because it requires some work on the facilitator's part, 
And I think a, a, the easy mistake to make is also to assume that the project staff that you're working with on a more regular basis are communicating with their leadership. They, they may not be, or they may be communicating things that are different from what you think is important to communicate. So um, our best practice is to periodically, every few months, schedule a meeting with the project uh, change team lead and the executive sponsor. And we want to encourage feedback. We want to hear how things are going. We want to adjust mid-project if there are any issues so that there are no surprises um, at the end. And lastly, I would just say you want to help leadership and project leads create a transparent communication plan about the project itself. So while we'll work with a small team, you also want to be mindful that the rest of the organization has some awareness that a project is going on. You want to make a plan about how much information to share and when. Um, you don't want people to feel left out. On the other hand, you don't want to share too early and invite lots of questions before the work has happened. But um, I think people miss this step. They think somehow that naturally the rest of the organization will just figure out what the project work is, and that can lead to, to trouble in terms of sustaining the changes uh, down the line. Great. Thanks, Carla. Uh, so picking up on Carla's comments about tailoring the message, I'd just like to kind of round out the discussion by asking Julie to discuss a couple of um, various messaging techniques. So in the paper, we discussed several examples of messaging techniques that can encourage practice buy-in. For example, uh, data feedback and benchmarking, identifying pain points um, that the practice is currently struggling with, and then offering solutions, and then also drawing on a practice's core values and mission, and kind of tying that in with the, um, the QI initiative um, that, that, that they're interested in working on. So I'm wondering, Julie, if you could just talk a bit about, um, based on your experiences, how these messaging techniques can be used effectively. Thanks so much, Kristen. And you know, I really appreciated what Carla said, stand in their shoes. I, I think that's so important. And both Carla and Jonathan have mentioned how this is about an, an entire team, um, in, including the front desk, the clinical staff, the non-clinical staff, um, all levels of the organization um, participating in these processes. Um, and I think that, you know, the 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 way a facilitator can think about this is really the idea of seek first to understand. So knowing knowing your group, what's important to them, um, and, and then you know once you know that, you can move towards um, supporting them in learning some of the skill sets and opportunities around quality improvement. And some of the things to consider in terms of, of part of that seeking first to understand is you know knowing the individuals who who is on the team, what are their roles, what are their responsibilities, Carla spoke to that eloquently. Um, what is the patient population that this practice serves and what uh, what are those patients and families, you know, what unique um, needs does that patient popul and family population bring? What's the practice's passion, you know, what, what do the, what do they like to work on, what's, what's bubbling up for them, um, and what is the leadership asking for? What do they have something that's of strategic importance? And again, as you mentioned, uh, Kristen, you know, what are the pain points? Is there something that's, that no one in the practice thinks is working well and that, that can be a great place to start as bringing the team together to globally work on, on a quality improvement uh, plan to address it? And, and then going back to data, data is an important component. It's important to, to utilize as you're putting interventions in to understand if they're having the desired effect. And, and so what does your data say about where some of your opportunities might lie? So I know, you know, that this is, this is systems work. So what I just said was a mouthful. It's a lot of different components. And, and, and the, other, the other reality of this work and, and being a facilitator is you know you need to understand which messaging works um, for what, what um, individual in an organization, how you describe the work to a CFO is different than perhaps a CMO that's different than an office manager for a very specific site that's different um, than the physician at that site or a nurse practitioner or the front desk person. So understanding each of those individuals and knowing how to build a messaging that would speak to them in terms of, you know, why they bring their best selves um, to work 
every day um, and and how to talk about is it quality, is it impactful on cost, will patients be more engaged, um, those components of the triple aim and, and how you might uh, engage each person as an individual in the work of QI even though their lens may be a little bit different and you know just to move into a little bit in terms of uh, data. Um, many times when you share data with a group and they're looking at their data and um, they discover that there's there's an opportunity for quality improvement, um, perhaps um, uh, some of the care is showing that they have an opportunity uh, related to components of, of managing a certain uh, chronic disease population. And that's an interesting time for practices. There's not a single person in an organization in healthcare who goes to work every day thinking, I'd, I'd rather not deliver <laughs> evidence-based care. And, and so there's this moment, and, and some of you have heard this, this stages of grieving that you help, have to help the practices go through when they're looking at their data and they're saying, oh my gosh, this is not what I thought we were delivering. And help them work through that and develop the passion into you know that energy of okay this isn't what I want to see um, this not this isn't what we want to strive to achieve so let's work together as a team and let's start to define that, that quality improve improvement project that we can start to to change what these numbers are, are telling us right now great thanks Julie um, so I think next we have already heard from Bob, um, but I think we'll turn it back to him to just kind of answer some of your questions um, and have a bit of a Q&A um, from the audience. Thanks, Kristen, and uh, thanks, panelists. Uh, what, a, what a great session. Um, I appreciate uh, all the depth of knowledge and experience that we're hearing from today. And what I just want to ask the audience is uh, be sure to send in your questions. Uh, we've uh, queued up a few, but uh, we'd like to hear more about what you'd like to hear from our esteemed panelists today. And actually, I'm going to start with one that is um, uh, moderator's prerogative here about something I'm interested in, and that's about building trusted relationships in particular. Um, you know, relationships are everything when it comes to this kind of work, I think. And I always reflect on sort of Jim Mould's um, uh, reflection that uh, the practice facility know they're, they've made it, they're trusted when they go in the back door of the practice. So I'd like to hear from all the panelists a little bit about building those relationships. Um, you know, how can you begin to build those relationships and uh, the relationship with the community? Anybody want to jump in first? So this is Jonathan. Um, th that's actually a, uh, it's both an important question, um, but one to which there's not a, uh, obviously a simple answer. Just like the uh, process for building a re any relationship um, is actually quite complex. Um, we've actually heard several of, of the, the just tactics, I guess, described already in this. Um, it really is uh, listening more than talking to start off with. Um, that's sometimes difficult in the uh, context of initiative where an external facilitator has a task to get done. Um, I, I think that our failures or my failures have often been trying to push an agenda uh, that's an external agenda rather than to really understand the practices uh, um, needs, desires, resources, so on and so forth. So uh, I guess I would just open this conversation with saying just like in any relationship developing uh, process that the, the primacy of kind of listening, understanding where the practice is, uh, being open um, is something that's more effective. That's not always leeway that folks have when they're in the midst of whether it's a research project or a funded demonstration project or something like that. Um, but uh, it's even in that context to the greatest extent one can kind of go gently I think uh, the more the higher the likelihood of earlier success thanks Jonathan yeah this is Carla I mean I can, I can jump in and add to that I, I mean I absolutely agree that listening is your is your primary tool um, the more you can listen and as I said before stand in their shoes try to understand what is important to them uh, the better you know I think um, and maybe I'm, I'm a little bit different from the others, although I'm not sure. I mean, we're, we're consultants, and, and um, I think sometimes when you're a consultant, perhaps uh, there's some 
uh, hesitation or distrust on the part of staff because they're thinking, you know, what are your motivations for being there or why has leadership brought these people in? And so you, you have a substantial amount of work to do to uh, establish trust with them. And a lot of that is, as Jonathan said, um, not as much as you can pr pushing your agenda and trying to hear what uh, what they want to have happen and trying to find kind of the sweet spot between, let's say, the goal of the project, the goals of leadership, and then how that can translate into changes on the ground that, that the staff on the ground um, feels, feels good about and doesn't feel is just you know, something um, put on them. Thanks, Carla. I uh, appreciate that. Great point. So we are getting a bunch of questions in. So thank you to the audience. And uh, let me just uh, tee this one up as sort of a, a bit of a theme. And, and maybe, Julie, you want to chime in first. And it's, uh, you know, what kinds of factors do you think are needed for practices to help them encourage to stay in for the long haul? Yeah, I think um, this, that really, you know, it starts out, with you know kind of the the what's the what's in it for me you know what am i gaining from this those those infamous withums and you know again it can be different things for different um parts of an organization you know it can be uh you know my day is better i you know the the practice is running more efficiently it feels less uh, chaotic so as they're working on quality initiatives they they start to discover some of those things of you know my, my day is going better you know from a clinician's perspective it could be the feeling that uh, they've they actually are doing what they went to medical school for or um, or clinical uh, school for and and for the staff as well you know having that same type of feeling that that they're contributing um, the the Im, the impact on leadership and culture is it is that you know for the long haul as we've heard um, from both Carla and Jonathan you do have to have leadership on board and you have to have a culture of of quality improvement and constant improvement and looking looking towards um, improving uh, patient care and and all of those I've seen help organizations uh, sustain but probably falls into the necessary but perhaps not sufficient category and I think what gets us over into that sufficient and and really staying up on this in in the long haul is thinking about value-based payment so moving from the fee-for-service treadmill that we know doesn't support achieving population health or uh, or the triple aim and in thinking about you know how in a much broader fashion, um, do we have value-based payment models that support population health, um, moving away from fee-for-service, you know, which is about you have to see someone in front of you, not a global taking care of patients and their families. Um, but and and you know, luckily, you know, there's good news in in this. There is work happening in this. We have comprehensive primary care initiative. We have other CMMI initiatives. We have CMS coming out, um, coming out and saying we want to move to value-based payment models that are moving away from from fee for service to really solidify that structure. Um, we have a variety of policy initiatives that are happening in order to support this. There are both regional and national payers. So we're participating in comprehensive primary care, and we've moved to a value-based payment model for primary care as a national payer. Um, other payers are doing that as well. So all of these, you know, I, I think you know you can't have this conversation without saying that appropriate value-based payment um, that it reach, reaches a significant penetration of patients within a practice really helps you move from that uh, uh, necessary to the sufficient um, ability to maintain the systems you've created to deliver patient care. Thanks, Julie. Yeah, gr great point. I think we're going to have time for uh, maybe two more questions. So let me tee this one up first. And, and this one is really um, it represents a theme that we heard. I think the people have um, connected with the, uh, the patient engagement aspect of the conversation. And, and the question comes, uh, how do practices go about choosing a patient to add to a QI team? Anybody want to jump in with that one? 
So this is Jonathan. I could tell you um, experiences that we've seen um, from practices. Um, often it's the uh, physician champion who has a patient who's been with the practice a long time who he or she thinks will have time and something to uh, contribute. And there's not necessarily any kind of systematic reason. In other cases, um, just like uh, we often see in hospitals and inpatient facilities, a patient who has had some sort of uh, challenge or uh, not so great experience with the practice um, and actively wants to participate in it is, is are the folks. Now that you have to be a little bit careful with, um, that it's not someone who um, simply has an ax to grind, but often patients who um, you know, are, are long-term patients of the practice have uh, complex medical problems, um, and experience some kind of frustration, but but are also appreciative of the practice are the ones that uh, contribute quite a bit. And actually, um, we, we have often seen, um, for instance, parents in, in practices that have kids, uh, parents of children with special health care needs um, who are concerned about lack of care coordination or experiential things, you know, ranging from the waiting room situation to um, you know, how, how their medical records are collected from various consultants are actively interested in contributing to uh, kind of the practice improvement thing. So it's really quite variable. Um, what I would also say is that a lot of the concerns people have about things like uh, confidentiality and uh, whether or not someone is going to understand the complexity of the practice and all of the administrative stuff that's behind uh, why practices do things the way they do just tends not to be a problem. So you don't necessarily have to have people who are experienced in healthcare and business or other things. Um, often people who have uh, modest means and modest educations um, still can contribute substantially to practice improvement activities. Thanks, Jonathan. That, that's a, a great answer. Appreciate that. Well, I'll tell you what, um, as much as I'd like to go through the rest of these questions, I think we're just about out of time. So, Marcos, if we can switch to the last slide, let's just do a quick summary of uh, what we've covered today. <laughs> like, that's going to happen. Um, but what we did learn today is uh, a ton from, uh, from our wonderful panelists today. Um, we've learned of ways to gain initial buy-in and trust, um, uh, I think, relationships. Uh, and, and all what we know as human beings about relationships can go a long way towards uh, getting that trust. We've learned how to tailor interventions uh, to the people, all of the people, as well as what the practice is. Um, I, I like Jonathan's thoughts about cadence and sequencing things. We've learned uh, ways to maintain buy-in uh, for meaningful and sustained quality improvement. So there's uh, lots of other things that we've learned. but. If you want to read the paper, let me make a quick pitch. Uh, you can find the white paper, and I have several of you have questions about this, at www.pcmh.ahrq.gov. Um, and you can also sign up for uh, ARC's practice facilitation listserv that you see on the slide there. So in my last comments, I want to thank, thank um, Kristen Giannotti and the Mathematica team for all of their hard work on the paper. I want to make sure I thank Jonathan Sugarman, Julie Schultz, and Carla Silverman for joining us today and for your wonderful insights. Uh, and Amy Gibson, Marcy Nielsen, thank you for hosting us today. And finally, thanks to you, the audience, uh, for staying on the line, even through the audio challenges we had initially. Uh, well done. And with that, I'm going to give, uh, give it back over to Marcy for the final words. I would just like to point out that Bob McNellis has a big future in, in radio, television, whatever um, media uh, you choose to embrace. You did a terrific job um, getting us through our, our small kerfuffle. Um, I want to thank everybody um, for being here today. It was a terrific conversation. I want to underscore um, Dr. Sugarman's point of going back to the website and taking a look at that quick start guide. Um, it is a, a terrific uh, and quick uh, overview of the paper, but mostly very practical ways in which um, uh, practices can use these these facilitators to help them um, improve their practice. So thanks everybody for joining us and uh, we look forward to having you join us next month.